Hi everyone! I am Anusha Hussain and I am so excited to be here with our esteemed panelists today to talk about mental health. I actually feel like my mental health <laughs> is very much on the perimenopause level. That is so hot. Um, but no, that's not true. Actually, that is true. Um, I feel like we talk about mental health um, so much and especially I talk about it a lot in my work and I think it has just become one of those things that you have to just uh, check off. And I got so used to telling people about the importance of um, taking care of your mental health and remembering to take care of yourself that I completely forgot to take care of myself. And so now I am actually a living example of what it's like when you're pouring from an empty cup, what it's like when you're taking care of everyone else but you. And guess what? All the things that they tell you is true. <laughs> you have to take care of yourself first. But I also feel like in this age, in this time, there's, so, there's just more and more on women's plates that we have to do. So while everyone's like, take care of your mental health, people define self-care and actually really taking care of yourself um, differently. So I would like to start with you, Dr. Al Ali Sharma. She said just to call her Ali, but you know, if you're a doctor, you're a doctor. <laughs> um, so there are so many terms now that we didn't have, you know, maybe when we were younger, like um, unpacking terms such as like burnout and self-care. And it's great that we have the language to describe so many things that we didn't before, but what do those terms actually mean? Like, how would you define them? Sure, so this is a great question. And first of all, thank you all for coming in. By the way, there's two seats up here if someone wants oh to come Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, come on up. I'm, Don't be shy. I'm Don't here, be shy. and that's what there's, there's, there's a back yeah. yeah. No. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so look, what is mental health? And I want you to think about your life for a second. Who surrounds you, your loved ones, if you have children, elderly, what does mental health mean in your ecosystem? Just think about a few words and just kind of create some space and pay mind to it. So in that context, for me, mental health is how we feel and how we function. It's a very simple way of saying it. I just find it, to me, it sort of summarizes what mental health is. And mental health can be, your mental health can be good if we think about how we feel and how we function. It can also be challenging and everything in between. Now to broaden that, mental health is also officially um, emotional well-being, social well-being, and your psychological well-being. And so, and I, I, you know, mental health is, we, we do use that term pretty easily, casually, and lightly, but let's break it down a little bit more than that. So as you think about mental health, is anyone willing to say just one word, what does mental health mean to you? Any volunteers, any brave people in the audience, or panelists? Stress. Stress. Therapy. 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 <laughs> Someone said calm. 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 Conscious. Say that again. Conscious. 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 Breath work. Sorry. Breath work. I love this. Balance. 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 Catharsis. Awareness. Awareness. Clarity. Awareness. Clarity. Resilience. Resilience. Oh, we're getting, this is good. This is like a well-rounded. <laughs> Anything else? Harmonious. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Something else back there. Harmony. Harmony. Presence. Presence. I love this. What about the harder stuff? Anxiety. You mentioned stress. Anxiety. Depression and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot there, trauma. and we can trauma. trauma exactly. Debilitating. Debilitating. Debilitating anxiety. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it can be all of those things, and I think the first point that I want to stress is that how you feel, whether it's anxiety, depression, sadness, happiness, elation, all of that's normal. They're all adaptive and healthy responses to things in our lives, and that's great. But when is it an issue? So the next level I like to talk about is um, emotional distress. So a lot of people experience emotional distress. You wouldn't be human if you didn't experience emotional distress. And so distress is a temporary disruptor in our lives. That's the way I like to think about it. So it can temporarily affect us, how we feel and how we function. But then when is it a more serious issue? So I like to use the term mental health conditions. I find it less stigmatizing instead of a mental health disorder. I find that very stigmatizing. But if we talk about a mental health condition, it's when symptoms like sadness, depression, anger, elation even, are prolonged, persistent, and severe. And they interfere with our functioning. So then how you feel really impacts how you function. And that's a mental health condition. So that's the delineation between like just feeling things and then mental health condition. 
So I hope that kind of sets the stage for like how I think about things as a psychiatrist. Um, and by the way, I am a practicing psychiatrist, uh, for those of you who may not know, and I have a clinic that we focus on anxiety, stress, depression, and trauma, but mental health is obviously more than that as well. Now, the other thing you mentioned was burnout, and then we'll talk about stress in a second. So what is burnout? How many, based on that word, how many of you have felt burnout? Most of us, exactly. <laughs> and um, burnout is actually a uh, workplace syndrome that is recognized by the medical field, not as a medical illness, but as a workplace condition. Mm. So it is, exactly, and it is recognized by the WHO, by the International Classification of Disease, the ICD-11, that's our disease system. And what is it? It is, the root cause is chronic workplace stress. So that could be, let's say, look, most, my dad was a CEO, former CEO, and he always says, most people quit their boss. Yes. Right? So a lot of times, at least in my practice too, right, it's relationship stress. It could be your boss, but it could also be your colleagues, it could be your team, it could be your vendors, it could be your clients, right, all of that. Um, it could also be the work and the volume or your dissatisfaction with the work based on it not resonating with you. I mean, there's so many ways that, uh, that you can feel workplace discontent and then chronic workplace stress. And then what happens? Over time, three things are sort of common. So one is reduced effectiveness at your job. You just can't do it at the level that you used to do it. Um, the next thing is like feeling really depleted or exhausted, right? We all probably have experienced that. And the other thing which is interesting is like distance from your job where, you know, maybe your job was a source of pleasure or at least you were engaged and you can become really distant from it or cynical or even negative around it. And the great thing is what alleviates burnout? Taking a break. So, so, and I always wonder, like in the medical community where there's a high rate of burnout, I was working in these hospitals where people weren't using their PTO. And I always use every day of my PTO because I like that, but a lot of people don't take that liberty, whether it's not giving themselves permission or whether they feel like it's not, they're not supposed to or whatever else, whatever other considerations there are. You know, and so the difference between burnout and depression, for example, because they can feel the same, is that if you, t if you have a depressive episode, and you take a break from your workplace, you're still gonna have the symptoms, and probably more when you create that space. So that's a little bit about burnout. Now one more thing, if you don't mind, stress, and then, so let's talk about stress. And I actually have a definition that I wanted to read. So, and I, I like this, this is from the WHO. So stress can be defined as a state of worry or mental tension caused by a difficult situation. And so it's a natural human response in response to challenges in our life. But chronic stress is the issue. Chronic stress can lead to insomnia, can lead to health issues, both health and mental health issues. We know it's linked to diabetes, like insulin resistance. It's linked to cardiovascular issues. You know, it's linked to anxiety and depression and so many other health issues. So it really is up to us. The first step is self-care. Self How do we take care of ourselves on a daily basis? And by the way, I'm feeling really hot too, so it's very menopausal thing, <laughs> and the weather outside. So, so how do we take care of ourselves? Our, our first, it's like, do just actually each one of you think, do you give yourself permission to take care of yourself? Do you carve out time daily? And I mean even five minutes of your day where you have complete silence, where you're staring at the wall or looking at a candle or with no one around you but you. Do you allow that for yourself? If the answer is no, then you need to do it. And it's amazing, the people in my practice, even though it's like mental health, psychiatry, disorder focused, so many times I'm talking about lifestyle and routines, right? And building in the resilience that we need or allowing the space to feel our feelings or just the time for us, you know, and especially if we're talking about midlife, you know, we know that 30s and 40s and beyond, we are more at risk because, our hormonal, because of our hormonal changes for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and then all of the other physical health and sexual health changes that go along with the menopausal transition. So we're at risk already. So it's of utmost, impor utmost importance to take care of ourselves during this phase of life. I'll leave it at that. That was excellent and amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Sharma. Um, we, so we, now we know what those terms mean, but how do you know when you, are ex when you need to up your self-care? Because I feel like we all have those moments where it's like, oh my god, I need a break, or I can't deal with this. But then you get up and you keep going. And you know, I read something that actually happened to me, which is when you don't give your body a break, um, your body will choose one for you. Yeah. That's exactly, <laughs> exactly what happens. It's going to shut it down. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so what are some of, I mean, 
the signs <laughs> of burnout because when you're in it, you can't always tell. That's Maybe true. other people can. So That's what are true. some signs we can look okay, for? Okay, so actually I'm gonna turn it to the audience again. What have you felt when you know something's not right? Just again, one word or phrase answers. I'm irritable. Irritable. <laughs> Huge one. Yes. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Who's been irritable when they're stressed? <laughs> yes. Okay. Absolutely. What else? What else happened? Insomnia. Happens? Insomnia. Exactly. Fatigue. Fatigue. Mood swings. Exactly. Headaches. What's that? Headaches. 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 Exactly. Physical Headaches. symptoms. What Disinterest. else? Disinterest. Disinterest. Exactly. <clears throat> Anything else? Poor eating habits. Poor eating habits. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. And it can be eating too much or eating not enough or eating a certain type of food. Carb craving is one that's common. That's mm -hmm. really important. Sugar. Sorry. Yeah. One, well, this yes. Is, we almost missed yeah. this one. Gut issues. Gut. Yeah, that's God huge. Issues. The gut brain is connection is, is huge. Yes, exactly. Huge. And actually, a lot of my clients for anxiety, stress, depression, and trauma come in with IBS. Right? So mm -hmm. it's a non specific term, which then, if you deconstruct it further with functional medicine, there are a lot of things going on, but that's a, that's a different topic. But yes, gut. And the you know, majority of serotonin re receptors are actually in the gut, which is interesting. Wow. Yeah. We have body aches and. Body yeah. aches. Exactly. And you just don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, exactly. tension, exactly. shoulders ache. Exactly. So, what I would say, just by every, all the examples in the room, is that it's different for everyone, and there's so much variability as to how it shows up. However, a few things are key it's that it's usually a change from your baseline, and you may not be aware. So that's why the space in your life is really important to sort of reflect. But things start to go wrong, right? Whether it's like, oh my gosh, why can't I finish this work assignment? Or why am I not sleeping and I'm getting up at five in the morning, right? So there are usually signs. So I would say if you're not functioning at your optimum or your peak, that's a sign that something's going on. So maybe that's a good starting definition. But the two indicators that I really love, and maybe these are a little late stage, but I think people recognize them when you talk about it, is insomnia. So sleep disruption is an indicator. And I heard the term the other day, which I didn't coin, but emotional distress is a disruptor of sleep. Wow. I love that. I read that in a medical journal. So that, that's, that's one way to think about it. The other thing is concentration. Mm -hmm. So are you having more trouble than normal reading the paper, reading a book, doing your work assignment, or even like focusing in on a conversation? And is that not you? So those are usually the two indicators that I ask about as indicators of, is this starting to affect our lives? And I love the way you talk about people taking a moment, even if it's five minutes for themselves. Yes. Because before all of those symptoms actually come out and happen, we should be thinking intentionally, deliberately, and consistently about our mental wellness. Mm -hmm. Because when we are functioning, functioning at a high degree, everybody, our family, our work, we raise them all up if we're feeling good about what we're doing. So we need to be very, very thoughtful about how we are really building our wellness, building our mental wellness throughout every day, starting with the practice that's consistent every single day. It's, it's, it is a mandatory thing, just like eating and nutrition and exercises for us. I know everyone goes to the gym, right? Yeah. So this is like going to the gym for you your mind. Yeah, for, yeah. for your mind. And I would add to do it without judgment and comparison. Mm -hmm. Because now in the world that we live in, and the Instagrams, and you see all these, we're doing, people doing so much, and they even can post it. And there's days where I'm like, how? Like, how did you even capture that? And how do you have your phone with you all the time to do all this while you take care of children? Why you do, your, why you do all this stuff? You cook dinner, and how are they finding time? And I know that that affects me even to this day of I add a level of expectation and compare myself and then that adds stress too. Mm -hmm. So I like the fact that you pointed out that we all will experience this totally different. Some are similar. There's some similar things that we will all experience as a, a, a side effect of stress. But then doing the inventory, doing the scan and just saying, whoa, write it down. Because sometimes, you know, you feel, you feel bad complaining. We do mm -hmm. so much for everybody else that we, we feel bad complaining. Taking the time, all that, well, nobody wants to hear us whine, or we don't have time to do it, you know? Just write it down, because that's also what I found to be a release, is you just get it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we Decoded. just suppress yeah. so much, so, yeah. Well, Christina, I wanted to ask you, because you do so much work with um, leadership and leaders, what are some of the strategies that you see your clients 
needing most or well, most important that you would want to give them? This room is filled with high achievers, women who are doing amazing things in the world. Oftentimes we try to outrun our stress. We try to outrun our mental health. And when we are outrunning it, that's when we are depleting ourselves. And think about your mental wellness as a bank account. We, we take withdrawals on it every single day, whether we're distracted, whether we're stressed or triggered by something, whether we have a detour in our day, those are withdrawals. And we need to not only make enough deposits into our mental wellness every single day, but we want to make more than the withdrawals. So as I said before, I think that having a practice that has exercise, that has nutrition, that has community, there's nothing better than filling your cup than having connection with people. And we know that there is a loneliness epidemic happening right now. Also, women in midlife, we have become so much. We've become high achievers. We've become <laughs> rising leaders. We've become wives. We've become mothers. And oftentimes in the becoming, we have stopped becoming ourselves. We've lost sight of who we are. We've lost sight of our purpose. Purpose is so important, particularly for leaders. But what's important for leaders is not only taking care of yourself, but if we believe that our most important assets in our companies and our teams are our people, if we believe that, then we are responsible for their well-being. We are responsible for their growth. So coaching plays a huge role in leadership, more so than ever before. And I think the last thing I just wanted to touch on is that really coming off of what you were saying is that we need to take the reins of our emotional leadership, of our mind, because we are going to get hit with a crisis. We're going to get hit with hardships in life. And when we take reins on our emotional leadership, then we're better suited, we're better prepared to handle some of those hardships in our life. That is so true. Sorry, I just went on a whole, <laughs> that put me on a whole different path because I was thinking about the other thing about middle age, which is so hard, tying kind of back to how do you know when you need to take care of yourself, is that there's so much care of other people's care that yeah. comes on, which you hear about and you see in your movies. And I remember looking at my mom when I was young and I was like, I'm never going to do any of this. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my God, I live in a different continent. Why am I getting the same? <laughs> crap that was poured on my mom's plate and it, it it happens to you and you don't even know you're like I don't want this responsibility but no one else is taking it I have to do it so it gets even harder because you're literally taking care of your kids your pets your parents and then you're like oh my god am I in perimenopause do I need to take care of myself too so in a way I feel like I, we have to take care of ourselves it really is the only way anybody else is going to survive, um, at least in my house. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you, Sonia, about your daughter. So tell me about your daughter and the work that she does in mental health and how you have been able to work with her. Well, my daughter is Sadell Curry Lee, and she has a platform for mental health. And um, it's really funny because my, it's not really funny, <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that she always tells me and her mantra is my mountains are my mountains and so you know we come from a privileged she was from a privileged life didn't have to worry about anything our family household was great and you know she began to play sports in high school and she ended up with five concussions within five years from playing volleyball and you know we're family and athletes so we're that pretty much that mindset of okay you're all right get up mm -hmm. you know how many weeks are they going to keep you out and then you can go back on the court and continue to contribute to the team and so I was an athlete or dad was an athlete and you know that was that hardcore and so you know for us we want to make sure they were okay but there was get better to get back on the court so she had one concussion a year mm -hmm. uh, starting her junior year and then senior year and then first two years in college one every year and then I started watching my daughter change. Irritable, not present, scatterbrained, 
um, very, very impatient, um, and she's a very loving person. And so, you know, first I was like, is this mother-daughter stuff? Because, <laughs> you, you know, we get yeah. to that point, too. But, um, and I was just like, no, something's wrong. So her last year, to finish the story quickly, took her to um, a doctor at UNC, and they were doing the NFL uh, protocol to see for concussions um, when all that was going on. And they examined her and said, hey, she could probably go back on the court and play her senior year, or, but if she's going to be more susceptible because she does not have the reaction um, capabilities anymore um, or as fast uh, to really avoid balls or whatever's going to happen. And so we made a decision for her not to play her senior year, which was crushing for her not to be able to do that. Well, then, fast forward, she graduates, she's very anxious because she doesn't know what she's going to do now. She moves out to the West Coast. She then begins to do, um, two years later, IV, and like all this stuff is just pushing down on her. We're, we, we have some personal family things that we go through, and it just, just, it just crushed my daughter. And she said, the moment for her, so I'm watching all this, and I'm making all kinds of mistakes. Mm -hmm. I want to solve all her problems. I'm listening, but I'm really not listening. <laughs> um, and so she just would get more and more upset with me, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? Then I'm getting upset because I'm like, she doesn't understand me, and we're having this dynamic. And so she said that she first realized for herself, was she was, she's a psychology major, and she went to school, went to a class and she was hearing all the things that go or indicators of anxiety. And she said she just went, that's me. Now we're African American and we're not used to acknowledging in our culture, depression, anxiety. We gotta be tough, we gotta show the world we're tough and we are resilient. We are very resilient people. So, you know, when we're struggling with things you can't let people. It's a sign of weakness. Um, and so I'm kind of doing that with my daughter and I don't even know that, you know, it's just what, what, how I was raised. And so she said, she came back and she was like, that's me. And so then she, there was a resource on campus and they had a team psychologist, sports psychologist. So she went to the psychologist and began to get help then. And I didn't even know it because she didn't really want to share it with me because she didn't know how I would take it. Um, so I, my daughter dealt with this for several years without me even knowing. And then finally, as she was going through her IVF, I began to say, what is happening? She began to share with me more. And then through her IG, a friend came to her and said, hey, you want to make some money? You can sell products on, <laughs> on, on IG. And she was like, I know I want to do more than that. That I just don't want to start an IG and become an influencer just to make money. And so then she began uh, her platform with mental health then. Um, and what I've learned along the way just from watching her, and I still get upset about it because I worry that how much my daughter suffered actually by herself, but um, that our mountains are our own mountains and we can't judge other people. We have to listen. So giving a safe space for people to just talk yes. and listen. And ask them, is there anything I can help you with? If they say no, they say no. But then you just offer it. And then if you can't help, you can't help. But be honest about it. Um, and just let them know that you're there to not judge and to just listen as well. And then I started educating myself. Started with her IG and watching the stuff. And then she would have uh, you know, some live uh, guests come on. And I would watch those and just enlighten myself. And then I started realizing, oh my gosh, I went through mm -hmm. that myself. Yeah. I crashed. I graduated, I mean, retired after 29 years of starting my own school, running it for 29 years, and went through depression after I retired because those are major times mm -hmm. in lives when we go through that and we don't, our bodies are used to being in a rhythm and we don't know what to do. What's our next purpose? T literally crashed. Got sick, got sick, got, uh, went through all that gut thing that happens with not being gluten-free, 
thankfully I wasn't anything worse than that, but um, shingles, everything in a three month period, my body just said enough is enough. So it will happen if you do not take care of yourself, your body will uh, tell you. So I realized that and then I realized, wow, we have a history of it. My mom, mm -hmm. depression, ended up going into um, a mental institute program um, to deal with depression and um, through relationships. Um, and that was another thing that my daughter went through was her freshman year. She, uh, senior year, freshman year was with a guy and he just verbally abused her. And I didn't know, I had no clue. And she just suppressed that, suppressed that. And a teammate of her finally told me this is what's going on, and she struggled. So she, concussions, relationship uh, abuse, and just all this, and that was a young lady then. She was 21, 19, 20. Um, and then that everything just gets compacted unless you get help. And so uh, watching her be brave enough to go to a therapist, so now I go to a therapist. <laughs> um, because you need it, you yes, know, you, and you need somebody who doesn't really know you, yes. um, who can be very neutral about it, and there's no shame in it um, whatsoever, and um, just talk. So, you know, I sum that up to say she's taught me a lot about educating myself on it, and then two, finding a, a safe space, somebody, whether that's a professional or not, um, not isolating myself because you will want to isolate mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't, you gotta let people knock on the door. You gotta take people's text messages. You gotta do it and it's scary. You, you gotta do let not, them in guys. You gotta <laughs> let them in. We were built, we were created to be in community. God created yes. Adam and said he needs a helper. And God <laughs> created us. God created us because he wanted us. He wanted a family. So we are built for community. So we can't isolate ourselves. And then we have to take the moments. I mean, take, she's learning that now with two children. Take the moments to just breathe and don't feel guilt. Just tell that guilt to go away. We don't have time for guilt. You bring up so many important things. And one of, one of the things that I really connect with is, well, first of all, the dynamics between mothers and daughters because my 12 year old is about to turn 13 and I'm like, why do you have to analyze everything? Why are you questioning everything? I'm like, oh my God, this is my child. I was like, listen, I really want you to be like empowered and go challenge the world, but not in the house. The house <laughs> is not a democracy. Exactly. <laughs> I am a leader. But it is so important about therapy. I will say that I've lived in the States for 25 years, more than 25 years, but I was born and raised in Bangladesh. And I didn't, even, even though therapy is so normal in the States and everybody's in it and it's great, it's so funny. The, weird ideas I had about it and now I am finally in therapy and can I tell you something everybody needs to be in therapy especially black and brown people yes. because we have pushed it away and what is it it's because they're you know white women are weaker or white people are this and that and it's like no we all need to talk it out and this thing of keeping it in and keeping your what is it you know don't hang your dirty laundry out to dry yes. I mean I really think I don't want to generalize, but I really think South Asians have taken that very seriously. <laughs> We're like, how do we make women continue this for eons and, and millennia? And I think it's starting to break. With South Asian Americans also in, in, in the US, so I think it's so exciting. But I noticed this with my daughter as well, because first of all, it's really scary. Yes. It's really scary to be a mom. Did you guys know this? No one told me this. <laughs> um, but now that I am one, you just want to fix everything for them. And it's so funny because the other day I was like, Ava, if you don't understand, you have to do X, Y, Z. And she was like, Mom, you didn't even grow up here. You grew up in Bangladesh. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, she's right. I actually have no freaking idea. And I don't know anything about this phone. So I was like, oh my God, I can't believe she made a point. And she's yeah. right. I'm like, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's so important to, to shut up and listen to your yes. kid. It's incredible because you know what I realized? Cause it's, it's also very strange to be a mother when they think you don't know anything or you haven't experienced anything. It's like, okay, I have been around um, for a little bit. Is that, you know what, just shut up and listen. I have so much to learn. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to go to you for 
you just solve all of their problems. Even though that's what I re really like. I wish my mom was here to solve all my problems. They really want somebody to listen. Yes. They need to know that you're there. So that is... Can I speak to that for a second? Right. Yes, of course. So I'll just tell you, while you were talking, I was thinking one of the hardest things about learning to become a psychiatrist or a therapist is learning to sit in silence with someone. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Right? Mm -hmm. And I know what you're talking about based on your culture or your own upbringing, your own experience of a mother or wanting to fix things or your own anxiety about having a child who has a problem or anxiety. It's, it's also, you know, it's a not knowing. We're not taught these things. Yeah. We are taught by example and those examples may not be perfect or even close to what is, is right. But like the hardest thing even for me and I come from an Indian family that doesn't talk about emotions, um, <laughs> you know, was just to learn to sit with a patient and, and just when they were silent, don't say anything, like just let them think. And always when you learn, because there might be discomfort for me, but when you have that silence, always something comes up for the person because you've created space for them, right? The yeah. space that we were talking yes. about that we don't have. So even, I, I'm a mother, I have a six and eight year old, I'm actually a single mother now, so that's, that has its own challenges. But you know, I, I have to fight with myself in my own head, like don't fix it, don't oppose what they're saying, don't try to change it, just validate it. Okay, yeah. so just tell me how you're yeah. feeling. You can tell me anything. You know, I don't know if you watch Dr. Becky, she has great tips, but like, <laughs> you know, just tell me, you know, however you're feeling is okay. But if you cross the line and you hit me, okay, that's something else, <laughs> right? But it, it really is about the validation. I don't think we're taught that, right? No. And also you were kind of alluding to the culture of toughness. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, you know, we might come from a culture of toughness or a place where emotions are not tolerated and all of that. And that impacts the way we talk about mental health or that we allow others to mm -hmm. talk about it. So we really have to give ourselves permission and the people around us permission. And she said that too, just give yourself grace. Yeah. And we don't do that. We don't do enough of that as women. We don't do give it. ourselves grace for not meeting whatever high standard we set for ourselves, really. <laughs> we don't give ourselves grace that we're doing everything. We're getting every day and being intentional about our responsibilities. That's enough. If you can be intentional about your efforts every day, at night you should give yourselves a lot of grace for the clothes you didn't get washed, mm -hmm. the meeting you maybe felt like you didn't do as well in, the, well, I, did, I wasn't able to make it to one of my children's sporting events or activities, yeah. and, or I was late getting there and I missed some. I mean, there's so much at the end of the day we can just hammer ourselves on. Give yourself grace, let it go. I, I, there's a, Thing that this guy told me one time and he, it's a story I guess and he comes home every day and he goes to this tree in front of his front yard and he touches it and then he goes in the house and a friend of his was visiting one day and he goes what are you doing and he goes um, that's my uh, worry my worry tree mm -hmm. and, and he was like what and he said yeah I come home every day and I put my whole day on that tree and the that. worries and the incompletes and the Ooh. failures because when I come out the next day, I get to choose which one of what, what of that I want to take off the tree and take into tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow, let go of today, the present, mm -hmm. when it's done. Because trust me, whatever is going to be there tomorrow, it's still going to be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But part of mental health is being able to release and let go and handle what you can handle. I also think it's interest. It's important to kind of like check yourself. Do you actually know what that means? Because I feel like, yeah, yeah. So for so long, my girlfriends were like, and we love you, please, you have to go to therapy. I'm like, no, I don't to just talk to someone. People really don't understand what therapy is, really. It's not just talking to someone. Having an outside, I mean, I know you know you're a psychiatrist, but having that outside perspective, sometimes just the questions your therapist asks you is so on point or thought provoking that you're like, I have never thought about this in my life or nobody has ever asked me that. So I think that's another thing. Like I thought I knew what anxiety was because everybody around me is anxious and my sister has like debilitating anxiety. And you know, most, most people that I know that have anxiety, really they have difficulty making decisions or they can't leave the house. So I always associated it with that. Then it turns out I am high functioning anxiety. I'm the opposite of my sister. <laughs> she shuts down, but I just want to accomplish, accomplish, accomplish and just check things off my list. So another thing is, you have, it's just like we do with depression. Depression isn't what you think it looks like. It doesn't show up the way that you mm -hmm. think. Anxiety and depression, you know, they're, they're kind, they go hand in hand. And it's interesting how similar I think also anxiety is because even now I'm in this field, I work in women's health and I was like, 
I really didn't understand what therapy or anxiety meant. I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My husband's like, that's great. <laughs> Let me tell you what it is. So it's so funny. I just have to comment because I also realized this in my mid-20s. There's actually a, a term for what you described. Oh, really? Which is really cool. When I learned it, I was so excited. It's called a manic defense. Mm. So Ooh. meaning, meaning, and this is a psychoanalytic term, but meaning you have emotions or you have early childhood experiences or things that you're not dealing with or you're the type of person that compartmentalizes. You push away your feelings mm -hmm. automatically. You don't feel them. And some people, yeah, exactly. No, a lot of us do this. And some people, it, it really, you gotta look at how you cope. Some people actually do more to yes. run away from those emotions. You don't realize you're doing it. It sort of like happens automatically. But have you ever done that? And you're running and running and running. And then you're like, I'm burning out. I can't run anymore. Wait, I'm starting to feel bad. What's happening? And then it shatters. And there's usually something emotional underneath that. So I even sometimes have to call myself in check and be like, why am I like sped up a little bit? Why am I doing? And often there is something underlying. Manic defense. So a what manic is it, like defense. defense mechanism it's, a, it's, to... a, it's, your, it's your mind or your body or your, your being protecting you from feeling those painful feelings. So how can I overachieve to not feel bad or sad? Yes. Oh, <laughs> manic <laughs> defense. So when you think about it, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. And of those thoughts, it's wonder what, what, that we have mismanaged minds, right? Yeah. 60,000 thoughts wow. a day. 80% of those thoughts are in our subconscious. Mm -hmm. And 95% of those 80 are running on repeat. Mm -hmm. yes. So we are saying negative things about ourselves all day long. And I love that you said, give yourself some grace. And I love the let go tree. I'm calling it the <laughs> let go tree. The let go tree. But what we also have to do is recognize all the things that went well today. Yes. yes. We go to bed and we're like, oh, I wish I should have showed up in that meeting. I wish I had been more attentive to my daughter. And what are the things that I did really well today? It's really hard for women in particular to recognize themselves, to give themselves credit because we think we should be humble. But why are we being humble with ourselves? Why don't we tell ourselves that we did a pretty good job today? And just that switch, just that exercise of recognizing yourself can allow you to go to bed with a little bit more peace. Mm. Yeah. Gratitude. Yes, gratitude. it's gratitude. <laughs> exactly. And you can even acknowledge one thing that didn't go so well, and then two things that did. That did. Yeah, yes. just like an overfocus on the positive. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time, but you know I could talk all day about mental health in my family, and especially with our amazing panelists. Uh, so I'd love to open it up to the audience. Sure. Um, so thank you all for doing this today. Um, so I have endometriosis. Um, and it's a condition that causes chronic pain. So I just wanted to know what your perspective is on how to utilize mental health to maybe assist something that's more physiological. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Really good question. So here, I'll say one thing, because obviously mental health care has to be tailored to you, right? Yeah. You have a specific psychology, a specific physicality, a specific spirituality, if that's there, all of those things. And so it, it would have to be tailored. So, but some of the things that come up in my mind as you ask that question is, well, how is the pain impacting you? You know, for some people I've seen that, you know, with pain can come excessive worry or excessive frustration and it can spiral in different directions based on who you are and your core beliefs. Um, or it's the physical pain can bring out other things, right? Other physical issues or mental health issues. And so that would be my first question. And then from that, we would build a, a care plan, you know? So I don't know if you wanted to ask a follow-up, that's fine, but it's really personal, I think. Like, what can help? But it definitely can help. And one of the things that is great when you have a physical symptom or a physical condition that leads to a cascade of other things is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, because it's usually yeah. the pain that's the inciting factor, and then it leads to you feeling a certain way, and then it might lead to certain behavior, whether it's not going out with your friends or feeling really frustrated doing something else. So it's cognitive behavioral therapy is a really good mechanism. Um, I also, sorry, this is something I actually, it came up uh, in my book. First of all, all my respect to you because endometriosis is no joke. But also, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Nithika Cho uh, Chopra and um, Chronicon, but she has created a community for people with chronic illnesses who live with chronic pain and so much of because I feel like we are all still learning. A lot of that support that we're actually looking for is online. 
Um, so I would highly recommend you look her up. And she has this conference in New York, actually. I think it's happening later this month or next month. But anyhow, it's called Chronicon. And she is in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Williamsburg, Brooklyn? Oh, cool. But I highly recommend. She's really big on social. Good. That's really good. Yeah. I have a question. Um, Therapies out there for anti antidepressant drugs, like SSRIs. 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 I think. Are you seeing any shift to like microdosing or anything that's coming out that is going to be more helpful than the regular antidepressants that have been out there for years? Yeah. So that is a great question. And so just so you know, just to give you a little background on my practice, which is called Being Health, we have four areas: so psychiatry, psychotherapy, the classic stuff. Um, novel treatments, so one of ours is ketamine infusion therapy for treatment-resistant depression, and we're looking at other novel treatments, so I'll wow. tell you about that. Functional medicine and wellness. So we have acupuncture and functional nutrition. And by the way, you have a card. There's a little discount offer oh. if you want to do the wellness <laughs> stuff. Uh, but let's talk about that. So honestly, what I see in my practice is that the majority of people do really well with antidepressants and therapy. And that is based on the theory of depression, let's say, that it's a single neurotransmitter hypothesis, so meaning serotonin or serotonin and norepinephrine too. But we also know now that there's a lot of other causes, root causes of depression. So um, there is brain, there are brain considerations, the frontal cortex, the amygdala, there's metabolic considerations, there's inflammation, right? So we know that you really have to take a 360 degree view. And again, it, like I said to your, your, in answer to your question, it really is a personalized and tailored plan that can help someone. So that being said, so let's say about two thirds of people who have depression do really well on therapy and meds or, or meds. Um, there are, there's about 30% have something that's called treatment resistant depression. And the definition is that you don't respond to two trials of medications. Um, so for those right now, we can do tr ketamine treatment. Um, we have, there's a intranasal form, we do IV, there's also IM. And then also what's coming up, which is really cool and exciting, because the tools in our toolkit haven't changed a lot over time, even since my training or the last 50 years, but there's now 50 plus clinical trials on psychedelics. And the ones that, the ones that I'm watching, psilocybin for major depression, is showing such good results. Wow. And it was sort of fast tracked through. And the, the dose is really low. So it's, you know, people come into me saying, I've been microdosing. I'm like, you're actually macrodosing. That's not <laughs> microdose. <laughs> Tell me your, your grant. Yeah, I'm serious. And people, just so you know, like there is actually high up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And people have been using a, not under clinical guidance, and I've had to hospitalize people. People get oh suicidal. So these psychedelics are not for everyone, but there's a lot of recreational use, and a lot of people have these amazing experiences on it. But the, the clinical trials show a very low dose, two doses of psilocybin within a 12 week period of psychotherapy where you prepare, where you integrate, and you do the therapy piece of what comes up in the sessions, and then you move forward. It's really like a, it's a facilitator. So that's really good. We're also watching LSD for generalized anxiety disorder. It's fast tracked through its, its breakthrough status. So it's been like flagged because the clinical evidence really, is really wow. great. Yeah, and then there's others as well, but those are the highlights, the psilocybin, and psilocybin for alcohol use disorder, which I think is a phenomenal wow. breakthrough. Wow. Because wow. You know, alcohol use disorder is a very difficult thing to treat, in my experience, and if we, yeah. this, this is showing to be promising. So there's a lot How going exciting. on. Yeah, and oh, one more, sorry, MDMA for PTSD. That's also, a lot of veterans are in clinical trials, so that's also showing very promising. promising. So thanks, thanks for that question. It's a novel treatment. We have a question. Oh. So you hear like a lot about resiliency, and so my question is like, what if you run out of resiliency, like are running out? <laughs> what is, is like, are there any suggestions, guidance? Like, it's, it's almost like, I don't want to hear be resilient anymore. I don't want to be resilient anymore. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I'm talking so much, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Okay, so an amazing, um, psychiatrist on our board, who's the head of mind-body medicine at Harvard, he talks about the ratio of toxic stress to resilience. So it's that ratio that's really important, meaning if resilience declines, the effect of toxic stress is gonna be that much greater, yeah. right? Or if toxic stress declines, you're gonna feel better, right? So you're talking about how do you take care of this bottom part, right, the, the denominator. So how do you build resilience? Um, there's a lot of answers to that. And again, it's taking a look at your life and what's happening in your life. But let's start with the basics, sleep. Like, is your sleep optimized? 
Are you sleeping seven hours a night consistently or whatever your consistent amount of time is? Are you a six hour night sleeper? Let's think about nutrition. Are you thinking about a balanced diet and thinking about those factors that might cause inflammation and really impact your resilience or your mental health? Let's look about livelihood and work. Where are the stress points? And why are you feeling depleted in terms of that resilience? Do you need a recharge and a reset? And what can that look like within the constructs of your life? You know, and then let's think about tobacco, alcohol, drug use, right? Is that, and even caffeine, right? Is that impacting you? And then beyond that, what is the stress, right? And is the, is the stress a pattern of things? Is, it, is there something you can work on to decrease that stress? You know, or do you need a, a, to take time off, right? And help from your loved ones to do that, right? So there's, there's a whole way to, Think about that, and then if it's a mental health condition, then talking to a licensed mental health professional or start with your doctor to look at are there physical health issues that are leading to that depletion in your resilience. Physical health is so important as and well. And is there something to the difference between identifying the stress in your life, like yeah. is it distress or is it you stress? And so we sometimes will lump all stress yeah. into one thing yes. when there's really some good stress that propels us mm -hmm. to be at or it might not be your stress. Right. Actually, I have an answer, a non-medical answer to your question, which I've just discovered. It's boundaries. Yes. Boundaries. Boundary People see you're resilient, you keep being resilient, they think you're just resilient yes. on through life, and they're gonna suck that resilience off of you. Recently, yeah. I've been like, I'm so worried about X, Y, Z, and then I'm like, oh my goodness, it is actually not my problem. <laughs> it really isn't. It's this person's problem, and she's not worried about it, so maybe I shouldn't need it. So really, I think boundaries is a big one. Another word that you hear, but do you really know what that means? It's not really, you know, being rude or being a bitch, which I highly recommend, um, but just saying no, or maybe not, or just more direct. We're saying yes. Yes. Boundary setting is Boundary good. Boundary setting is yeah. huge. Boundary setting is good. Carol, I know you keep looking at me. Yes. I don't know if it's because you want to hug me or tell me to wrap up. Very good. I mean, I would continue forever. <laughs> There's a great I book for that, too. If you heard Boundaries, <laughs> it's, called, it's a book called Boundaries, and his name escapes me, but I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna come Just look at it. Yeah. I've been, look it up on Amazon. I've been through the whole program. I probably could tell you all about all the programs that are out there. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. Thank you to our family. Oh, you're inside.